morning, everybody. This is Mortgage Pros 411. I am Audrey Boisino and my co-host, Kevin Casey, who's laughing because next to our illustrious guest, Trisha James, is Ranger, the giant schnauzer. So just stand by. He'll show his face eventually. I mean, probably sooner rather than later, but we all have there that. There he is. And there he is. <laughs> you had to call him. Oh, my God. Well, his head is bigger than your head, Trisha. So um, I know. Okay, so quickly, we just want to remind everyone, it is that time of year. NMLS is sending us nasty notices saying we haven't gotten our stuff They're together. They're not sending me any nasty notices. Uh, I think it's just you. You know what? Maybe uh, maybe you blocked them in your email. Sit. But regardless, we need to get our NMLS done. And Kevin and I are teaching a few classes live. The first one being August 24th in Daly City at a beautiful golf club. Right, Kevin? It is a beautiful golf course. And then I can't remember the dates of the other one. So in case, unless the other are in September, whole month after that. So we've got plenty of time. That's right. So um, this one is sponsored by San Francisco Peninsula Camp. And the other one in, it's September 12th, I think, in Thousand Oaks. That is Greater Ventura. And then we have another one in Sausalito. That's, oh, I love that one so much. Oh my God. So beautiful. Anyway, at the Yacht Club. All right. So moving right along. Last week, we had Bill Lohman. It was cool, the adventure. I'm not sure he really meant it that he was going to have his friend's yacht pull up to the Sausalito Yacht Club after the NMLS class and take us off for a sailboat ride. I hope that was true. But the other things we talked about were the Basil Capital, Basil, Basil, Basil. It's not a, it's not an yeah, earth. Basil. Yeah, it's uh, it's not it's not something you put in your spaghetti sauce. So anyway, the capital proposal, which is being promoted and proposed by the Fed, FDIC, and OCC, there's a meeting happening on that little thing today. So we'll see what happens with that. We talked about credit tightening, the GSE GSE buybacks, um, how LOs and borrowers are so hyper focused on rates. We're going to talk about that again today, kids. And we talked about delinquencies and all sorts of things. So if you want to listen to that, where do they go, Kevin? I think it's called YouTube. <laughs> okay. Little with 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 feeling this time, Kevin. Uh, yeah, you just go on YouTube, you know, Google Mortgage Pros 401 or not you Google YouTube Mortgage Pros 401. I was just gonna say and I don't think you right up. on YouTube, but whatever. You, you might just search. Google us on YouTube and you'd probably find the YouTubes that way also. I think it's funny that instead of search, we all say YouTube now, or Google now. So um, anyway, all right. So there you go. We are moving right along. There is a lot to talk about. And guess what? Our focus today is sunshine and unicorns because it has been so negative And so, I mean, I found myself just angry last week about all the crazy crap that's going on out there. Angry, like actual anger, which I don't typically go to um, unless I get fired about up about some mortgage thing. So today we are going to talk about what is happening out there that is What's good. Working? There are loans closing. There are things that are are happening and we need to, as LOs, get our minds off of what are the rates doing. Now, do we need to have the information? Yes. Is it important to understand what's going on in the market? Yes. Why? Because our clients are watching the news and they all think they're experts because the media is telling them a bunch of crap that isn't true. So you as an LO have to have the correct information so that you can counter their arguments with actual facts and not their nonsense that they're- I think the word is not crap. I think it's Huey is used. Huey? Huey. Oh, no. Huey. Oh. God, I always say it, but now I can't-, I can't Huey. Even... What? Huey. Huey. <laughs> God. <laughs> anyway, so bottom line is we're really going to focus today on what you can do and some positive things like, for instance, do you know that mortgage delinquencies are the lowest that they have been since 1979? Did you guys see that? Crazy. I thought it was 72, but you know. 79. I have it right here in writing, Mr. Casey. So uh -huh. it is, they, delinquencies are way, 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 way down. That's the good news. The less good news, but good news for us potentially, if we help our clients properly, is credit card debt is gone over a trillion dollars. Mm -hmm. It is up so significantly that it's kind of mind boggling, actually. And so, $45 billion increase just in Q2, kids, $45 billion in credit card debt increase. The average rate is 21 to 25%. 
and it, they have the highest delinquencies in five years. So there are there are opportunities for us. Student loan payments start again October 1st. The, the interest starts accruing again in September. So this is all a big deal. There's $199,000 average tappable equity, meaning people, after they leave 20% equity in their home, they still have, on average across the nation, $199,000 in tappable equity. We have a lot of opportunities. So Trisha James. Yes. I know that was, a, that was the a, land of opportunity. I'm super hey, um, excited. Hey, before we go there, there's a couple other things I want to talk about before we get to Trisha. There's a couple. Oh, of so sorry. I forgot about those. Um, so one is uh, the big thing in the Bay Area is MLS is down, multiple listing service. Um, and so it's really affected a lot of appraisals and real yeah. estate is getting deals in a contract. Um, but as I was explained to uh, Audrey this morning, we are in the United States of America. We don't live in Europe, where if something like that happens, they all just throw up their hands, and say, well, we can't do anything. Um, they are now finding workarounds to the hacked system. And either that or they paid 60 million in Bitcoin. But okay, did you make up that 60 million dollars in Bitcoin? I made up the 60 million. I don't know what the hackers want. They always oh, want okay. So you just if made it up. If you gave a okay. hacker 60 million, they'd be happy, right, Tricia? I just want everybody oh, yeah. to know yeah. I am here. I am here to keep Kevin from like veering so off into fantasy land. Okay, so the hackers is a real thing though. The hackers took over this system and it's not MLS, it's Rapatoni. Yeah, um, Rapatoni, yes. Yeah. It's Rapid Tony. They took over the system and hacked it and are holding it hostage or were. I don't know what's happened to this morning. Do you know anything? But you're in, yeah, you're in the tech capital. I mean, Northern California, Washington. So you have the people that invented the tech to this stuff. Yes. So there's you can't no know how to get around the hacking. System. Correct. And from what I've heard, they do. They have enlisted some of the people that have designed the stuff to go around it. And I think in the next 72 hours, you're going to see it revamp and up again yeah. yeah me too meanwhile my appraisal i was supposed to get yesterday i don't have it kevin did you get your appraisal that was i didn't get Friday? mine either they said they'll get it today though so yeah they're well using, we'll see what that using looks zillow like. to do it so okay well, okay well, that's a little around. scary so speaking of zillow how about this one zillow oh, ranger did not even plan this but can i just tell you zillow sold agents 137 million leads last year a hunt, okay, just wanted to make sure you got that. 137 million leads were sold by Zillow last year. There were 5.6 million sales. Yeah. Uh, what does that tell you, kids? Just checking. Hey, All right. Don't pay for that. <laughs> right. Um, okay, so Trisha. Trisha's with Champions TPO, correct? Correct. Okay. Tell us, Trisha. You're busy. You and I talk all the time, and you are swamped. And it actually, the interesting thing about that is um, I was at another company. I was doing well and I realized like number one in the company. Well, correct. And I still wanted to look at what else is out there. And um, we're going into a different market right now. Banks are tightening. So the type of loans that we deliver are changing. So before that $2 million person could put a million in the bank and get a loan at the bank and be fine. So I wanted to partner with someone that served my customers and served the community. And part of the reason I went with Champion is um, they're CDFI backing and the way that they look at a loan is to serve the community. So it opened up opportunity where I had owner rock, no ratio. I had my DSCR, my investment properties with very low reserves, but to make, they had a commitment to understanding and delivering service to the people that weren't getting that service. And that's what banks used to do. So I think it's going to be the bridge between what the local bank did and what's coming in the mortgage future. More and more people have went into, they're not into brick and mortar banks and they're going into non, you know, traditional ways of banking. So I think they need to go into non-traditional ways of borrowing. Um, the products, the, the loan officers that were comfortable the last two years with refinances and trying to, they they'll say to me hey i'm not busy well you're not busy because you're doing the same thing in a different market 
And that's right. why. So you have to reinvent yourself and you have to take the opportunity that is presented to you. Right. I was very comfortable at my other job. Um, the culture was not me, but I stayed there because I was doing well. However, what I want to say is right now, when people are saying to me, there's no leads out there, or like you just said with Zillow, you have a opportunity right now school is starting how many people are you seeing your kid goes to school there's an average of 22 kids in a classroom you're going to have parent teacher night so that's 44 people if you have two children that you're going to meet that you might not have met before right right uh, we've and then, talked about this before because kevin and i were both big time volunteers in our kids school room moms coaches coaches yeah i was on the business, you know i was way, president right. of walnut creek little league those are big huge opportunities for all of us you're totally right and so it's not always buying that zillow lead um as an example in moving i i usually get a lot of my loans come from inbound calls but i thought you know i got to do things different too so I thought I'm going to take my normal accounts, but I'm going to pick five people every morning by nine o'clock that work there that I've never made contact with. And so I'm doing that. And actually, it's been very good. I called one yesterday. He's like, I haven't had an AE call me. He goes, I used to work in a call center a couple of years ago. He goes, I'll give you a loan. He goes, it's great. And I said, yeah, that's the problem. People need to connect. It's not just broadcast emailing. It's not just yes. I'll send him a message or I'll text him. Yes. They, they need to, in this time when people have less loans, they need to have the handoff and, you know, make sure that they're partnered with someone that is actually delivering the same service. So it, hang on. So when you call, what do you say to them? I, as an example, um, yesterday I called Danny from another company. I said, hey, Danny, this is Trisha James. I moved over to Champion. Um, I do business with your company in the past. Your broker filled out the package this morning. I never did any loans with you, but I just wanted to tell you what Champion's known for. I said, they are backed by CDFI and basically I still have the same DSCR. I have a better I-10 and I can do a no ratio owner occupied. He goes, Trish, you can do the I-10 again. And I said, I can do the I-10 and I can do it well. And interestingly enough, he says, my brother is trying to get a loan. And he goes, I said, well, we'll do it on a to be determined. And he goes, that is stuff I needed to hear. And he goes, see, that doesn't come across in an email. And that's what I was trying to tell people. You're finding out about him. If I do his brother's loan, you don't think, or his cousin's loan, I'm going to get him as a customer submitting right. as a to be determined. Also, so then I called another one. I said, hey, you know, you're hung up at my old company. It's been like 20 some days and they're not returning your emails. Why don't you flip the DSCR over here? And he said the same thing. He's like, you know, Trish, that's what I value. I always talk to you. You, you, you and I work together for a solution. And what people need to understand, because there's less loans out there right now, you need to be active in the decisions that are going on with your loans, in the solutions and decisions that are going on in your loans. Don't just say my processor normally handles that. You know, I, the broker on the DSCR yesterday goes, oh, I could submit it, but I don't know what the fees are. I said, who's the escort? He goes, oh, my processor handles that. I said, it would be nice if you actually read some of the stuff that's in your files. And then the third call I made was, interestingly enough, um, Audrey knows this. I have a driver that has driven me for a couple of years. And um, he said, he texted me and I said, hey, who's your broker friend? Um, I'm going to call him. And so I called his broker in Northern California and he filled out a broker package by one o'clock and has a DSCR loan for me. So oh, you wow. got to go out of your comfort zone and yeah. you got to, you're only going to, your results are going to be from the actions you take. And that's what I try to tell people. You got to get out in the community. I know um, a lot of people with churches and stuff, people say, I don't belong to a church. I don't go to a church. Um, there's still carnivals and stuff going on at those churches. There's still bake sales and stuff. Stop by, you know, have your little lapel pin on that says you do loans. I, I mean, I, I just think you really need to get out there, but sitting home and saying the phone's not going to ring or you don't have loans. Those are not the loan officers I want to do loans with anyway, because quite honestly, they're the ones that complain about every step because they don't do anything. They don't make things happen. They let things happen. That's right. And that's our industry is full of that right now. Everyone got so comfortable. I mean, how many people are like, I don't want to go to the office. I mean, seriously, you don't want to go to the office. 
you don't want to get out of your house. You don't want to go meet someone. You don't want to do something new. That is not the way forward. So if, and what I've realized is we kept waiting, you know, we've been watching this wave happen for a year and a half, right? Inflation numbers went to crap and all of a sudden the rates go skyrocketing and the sky is falling. We don't know what the heck is going to happen and everything's uncertain. That was a year and a half ago that that was starting to happen it's been this big progression and we've been waiting for the rates to come down, waiting, 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 right? Uh -huh. Rates are not coming down. That is something we have to embrace. And it's also something we have to help our clients embrace and figure out what is an alternative. How can you afford to buy a house? Because yeah. what isn't changing or what has stayed consistent is values continue to march up. Right. Values yeah. is there, are there, demand is super strong. Now is the time to buy despite the rates. And let me tell you something about Trisha James. Rates don't deter her even the slightest bit. So her favorite thing is to uh, pull a rate right out of her ear and throw it at her broker and say, well, it's this, or maybe it'll be better. And then they price, the, you know, they, they adjust the price down later, but the rates don't bother the broker and the client because they know she can get the job done and they want their deals closed because she's focused on investment, on business loans, et cetera. And what is the what matters there? Does it cash flow? Is it a good investment? Will it appreciate over time? Is it going to cash flow? Cash flow, cash flow, right, Tricia? Mm -hmm. Yeah, or are you solving their problem? I mean, yep. how many problem. loans have we gotten in the last two weeks where parents thought they were taking out a, a student loan for their kids and the payment went from a four and a half rate last year to eight and a half? And they're like, oh my gosh, I can't afford it. I was going to get an equity line, but the bank told me no. And I'm getting these calls. I have a guy right now, he has triplets in college. And he said, I can do $200,000 on this investment property and cover their tuition for the next two years. I said, yeah, you can. And I said, you should take the money out now. We all know the rates aren't ticking down anytime soon. I said, can your rent cover that payment? He said, yes. And I said, okay, so you're investing in your children. Take that money out and use that investment. And if it can cover it, that solves that problem. And so you want to make sure you're solving the problem, not just talking about rate. I, I had a loan officer on some blog yesterday texted Someone tagged me and then I jumped in and she was like, my client's ready to cancel the contract because the rate's too high. I said, well, the rate is not significantly higher than three weeks ago. So what happened? And she says, well, the client thought the rate would be in the sevens. And I said, on an investment property that they're putting 20% down with a 680 credit score, your client was quoted a seven someplace. And she said, yeah, they were. I said, did you do that? And she goes, yeah. I said, then you need to show me where you got that because I don't see that in any algorithm that I'm looking at. She goes, well, it really wasn't. It was when they started shopping in January. I, I said, so they went to contract. And I said, we, sweetie, we got to work on your deal because your appraisal's coming in. Interestingly enough, her appraisal is coming in $100,000 more than the asking price, and her client got it for 900, I think 900,000. They got a 3% seller concession and at debt services. I said, so what are we talking about right, right. here? I said, your right. client's gaining 10% of equity plus the other 3% in seller concession, 13% right there, and you're talking about a rate that didn't exist that you misrepresented. I said, let's get the client on the phone and tell them that the payment is forty-eight fifty. The rent is fifty-six hundred, and the current tenant. I said, it's a win-win. She goes, well, they were hoping that they would get a thousand dollars back every month. I said, well, that they can refinance out of this. Let's do this to make the deal. They're gaining a hundred thousand dollars. Why would you call escrow to drop a cancellation contract until that appraisal comes in? Because that hundred thousand dollars they're gaining in equity is that's a wonderful thing for them. Yeah. yeah, it's amazing. And it's so often, I, I mentioned this a few weeks ago, I had a client put in an offer on an investment property and he texted me before he's putting the offer. He goes, we need to talk about the most critical thing. What is the rate? And I said, uh, sir, that is not the most critical thing. And you know, better. I, you know, I've known him forever. And so, you know, I gave him a you good slap. You slapped him around a little bit. I did. I totally, I totally did. And then he's like, I'm like, cash flow, cash, cash flow, Christopher. That's what I said. Anyway, so, you know, we have to be the ones who are setting our clients straight. And if we're not, we're not doing our job. And if you can't do that, then this is not the job for you. If you can't keep it real for your borrowers so they understand what this market is, how many times do we hear that, Tricia? I was hoping for, I was hoping 
No, you're wishing for something that doesn't exist anymore. And we need to let them know what does exist. Well, exactly. How many of our investors were doing fix and flip loans that they no longer can sell right now? And you're like, the good thing is we can get you in a permanent loan so you don't default and it can debt service. So it's a win-win. You might not be able to deliver the product or the property or unload it right now, but as long as it debt services, you're not losing money and you clear your credit, you move on to the next deal and this becomes a bread and butter unit. I have a Why contract. They sell it? Which, which markets are they not able to sell? You have to remember some of these people really over improve stuff. And oh, I'm yes. there you go. Yeah. And and so I have, that's I fix a flip guys constantly does it. I'm like, haven't you learned your lesson? Well, correct. And on this particular one, the guy put in a hundred and fifty thousand dollar kitchen on a seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar home. Oh my god. Oh my I know. God. And I said, so but he's crazy. lucky it does debt service. We got the 1007, it's gonna debt service. So but I have a contractor. He's done this. Uh, I've worked with him over the years, and there's been times when you know he's gotten to a market, and the market shifted. And now suddenly he can't sell the place as he thought. Uh, but he's always just okay. Fine, I'll just rent it out, and it'll debt service, and I'm good. And I was talking to him recently about his stuff, and he still owns those properties that mm. we had done this. He goes, "Yeah, those were the best things that ever happened to me." Correct. Because I didn't sell them, and now they they cash flow really nicely you know, 10, 15 years later, and I would never sell them now because it's just, it's nice cash flow coming in all the time. He goes, those were mistakes they, I made that ended up being the, some of the best decisions I ever made. And so that is a, a conversation you need to have. You need to also talk about your clients that have been making a living on the short-term rental market. Obviously in some markets that revenue has decreased off, off dramatically correct so i have actually been calling all my real estate contacts and saying hey i have got a way you can get some listings if you want go to airbnb pull up homes in your farming area and see what homes are listed on airbnb and then get the names of those owners and call them because they are getting 50 cents on the dollar at best of what they're getting last year and they're not renting out full time right now so they're not even getting 50 cents on the dollar. Um, and it's just, you know, really rough on Airbnb. There's too many listings. And uh, well, at least in the San Francisco Bay Area, people are not coming here for vacation right now. Well, and I think now would be a good time for Tricia to share the Taj Mahal toilet story. Oh, my, we're back to that. Okay, so last year when I was on your show in uh, September, I had a three point something million dollar home in Florida that mm -hmm. the guy had taken a bunch of toilets and put them in the backyard and used them to harvest plants or um, to grow vegetables because he said it was flood resistant. I at the time was not willing to give him a two point two million dollar loan without removing the toilets because one, the eyesore and everything else. He ended up going hard money. So my rate at the time was eight and a quarter. He took an, a 10 and a quarter um, because he had debt serviced it. The year before in 2021, he got 500, or no, 2020 got 500,000 in rental income, 2021, 350. And I spoke to him, I think it was yesterday or the day before, he got 180,000 only. So he said, I said, you know, I don't do retail. He goes, I tracked you down through the internet because you were the person that the loan officer had me speak to on why you wanted the toilets removed. I said, yes. And he goes, well, I'm not going with the loan officer because I took a hard money loan last year at 10 and a quarter instead of your loan. And now I have to get another loan and now we have less revenue on it. The other thing I said, well, did you remove the toilets? And he's, interestingly enough, he said, well, what happened was Florida insurance changed and they're doing inspections on everybody to redo their policy. So he says, I had to remove them because of the insurance. Yeah. So I yeah. know. So, and just, I want to sure highlight the fact about toilets that in your backyard. Um, because he said during hurricane season, they could become oh, they dislodged. Yeah, because they weren't permanently attached to anything. And they told him that they were a health and safety issue. So here he is. He had to remove all the toilets. And I'm sure that's not why his rental income dropped. But he goes, where are you at on a rate? I said, oh, I said, here's what the payment is. I didn't even go over. I said, but you got to get a loan officer to call me. I said, I don't discuss anything with you. Call your loan officer. So all of a sudden, yesterday afternoon, I get 
a call from someone for a broker package and Andrea will tell you, I'll say, hey, I do a broker package, but it's got to be someone I have a relationship with. I don't just put in packages. So this broker says, no, I got a referral from you. I said, all right, here's the package. My office will love it. Just go ahead and do it. So the loan officer reaches out to me at 6.30 last night saying, I'll do the package overnight. It's for my friend who has a three. And I said, the Taj Mahal of toilets. He goes, yeah, that's what you call it. And he goes, the toilets are gone, I swear. <laughs> and I said, okay. So the bottom line is the guy could have had a 2.2 2 million at eight and a quarter last year on a 30 year fixed this year. And he ended up taking 10 and a half at three points. Yep. Wow for a year or two years so again and again i want to highlight that the guy did not go back to the original broker who would not be tough with him and tell him what the real deal was was and help him understand that that was the way forward they were weak and they just let him control the narrative it sounds like and here we are and that lo is out of luck so um you mentioned insurance trisha i want to talk about that for a minute because it's a humongous issue right now. And I was talking to a buddy of mine in Louisiana the other day, and he was talking about a, a situation where he has a borrower who, who put an offer on a $260,000 house. They're doing an FHA loan for a loan amount of like 250 ish. And the insurance, which does not cover contents, liability, or loss of use with a $5,000 deductible is almost $6,000 a, a year. That does not include the flood insurance. And so guys, the insurance thing out there is no joke. And oh, yeah. we've had increases like that in, you know, Sonoma, we've had over a three to 4% increase. Um, this is, I, I and they're looking for reasons to cancel. So you, yeah. we've talked about it before, Kevin, Yeah. pay your premiums, do not be late by even one day. Late they will cancel day. You. I have a rental property and my sister-in-law is one who manages all the payments on it. She's a CPA really on top of everything. And she missed the payment by a day and they canceled on us. So not on top of everything as it turns yeah. out. Uh-huh. Exactly. Yeah. So and insurance, what people you need to understand when you're doing those DSCR calculations or debt service, make sure that you have the client get a quote on the yes. insurance because we are seeing substantial increases anyway this year. And especially if they have rent loss and stuff like that. Um, also, we're in hurricane season as part of the country. We have strange weather events going on. So make sure your borrowers, before everybody was like, oh, I just let the client fill out the application, get a copy of the binder at the time of the application. So we know what insurance we have going into the transaction. I actually have stopped doing that. I have a broker. I go to him immediately. As soon as they tell me they've got an address, I get a quote from him. I send it to the client and say, here's a quote. You can use it or not. But if I don't hear back from you, we're using it. And uh, they, nine times out of 10, they take his policy. Wow, that's a proactive loan officer right there, Kevin. I know. Can you believe that? No. <laughs> okay. So from our little friend, not little, our not so little friend, Dr. Elliot Eisenberg, he had um, published in his blog that we love um, in the year ending 323, that'd be March of 23, foreigners right. spent $53.31 billion buying U.S. homes the sixth annual uh, straight annual de decline in the lowest level since 2011. Foreign sales volume peaked in 2017 at 153 billion from um, four, well, whatever. Anyway, then foreign sales were less than 2% of the total sales. The median price paid by foreigners was 396.4. And um, 51% of the foreign buyers were recent immigrants or expats. Trisha, you do a lot of foreign nationals, a lot of I-10 loans. Let's talk about that. Tell okay. us what you're seeing, who's buying, what do they want, what, how do you find them? Talk about that. Okay, let's not do a matrix from 2017 for one, because the pandemic stopped the travel of foreign travel. So who's going to buy a half million dollar or a million dollar asset when they can't even come to the country? Okay. Listen, I've been listening to you talk about I-10s and foreign nationals for the last two years. So I okay. know you're doing them. Correct. But what I'm saying to you is the markets like Florida and uh, California, Las Vegas or Nevada, um, Arizona, Oklahoma and Texas, they have foreigners are still buying loans. I-10 loans. I, I mean, I love I-10 loans. You can do a business purpose I-10 loan at 80 percent DSCR. 
I mean, those people have no other opportunities prior to now. They had to go hard money. You don't think you're earning a customer for life when you can do that? Someone that puts their sweat into a rental and they always make their payments and stuff like that. Again, I, part of the reason I transitioned in my career to Champion was they're serving that community. They're, they're reaching out to the community and the whole purpose of this thing is they want to make loans to the underserved, okay? Definitely and that. Underserved. And that is definitely the underserved. When we're looking at the foreign national, for example, we have a governor in Florida that literally put in an assembly bill to not do loans for certain classes of people in this day and age. And, and not someone, only- did, Didn't someone let him know that was against federal law? Well, they're adhering to it. And quite honestly, there's lenders that are backing his decision. And interestingly enough, when I was considering switching companies, one of the companies who pretty much wrote me a check for whatever I wanted, that was one of their things. He goes, well, you know, we politically, we back um, the assembly bill in Florida. I don't let politics dictate my, what I do. And that's where you cannot make decisions. These loans have to be made to serve the clients. They're whatever nationality you are, whatever market you're in, we have to serve across the board, all 50 states. Right. And though there might be regional differences on LTV or something like that or type of product, um, you still have to deliver on it. And so the foreign national, foreign national people, um, there's a pride of ownership that they Absolutely. come to the, they come here, they have down payment or they work for down payment. Those loans, they perform, they know how to put it together, they're going to close. And guess what, in their country, usually the rate is three to 5% higher than whatever rate I'm giving them. So they're thanking us right. at the closing table because they're yeah. getting that eight or 9%. They don't care. They're getting a payment and they're owning something in America. Yep. And they're adjustable in the other countries. These We are one of the few places that have fixed rate mortgages. So they're getting a rate that they know they're going to know what the payment is for the duration as long as they want to make it. And they all come together often as a family and they make sure it works. It, yeah, they so, do. Correct. They're really uh, You know, the interesting thing loans. though is um, for your I-10 borrowers, you might want to follow up with them because the process for kind of getting your green card has gone from a minimum of two, two years to a minimum of four months. Correct. So they've waived the interview process if the application is clean, passes. Um, so- I've known of people getting their green cards pretty damn quick. Well, and she doesn't even need a green card. That's no, on an I-10 for. or a foreign national, you right, don't need it. But the rate's going to be a whole lot better if they if they got the I-10. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. No, actually, really? no. And that's what I wanted to tell you. So you can have a fully green carded um, person buying an investment property. What's your rate going to be? Probably 8.75. What's yeah. my What's my rate going to be on an I-10? Probably eight and seven eighths on that right. same thing. So- no, it, it's not all about they have to have everything completed by the government. They just have to. A lot of them don't even have U.S. credits. So there's ways around, you know, using alternatives and no FICO scores because there's ITINs and foreign nationals have a pride of not having a bunch of debt. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But the other thing, too, is make sure that you get those people approved before you write an yes. offer. Make sure they're pre-approved. Um, somebody asked the question, what's the DSCR? So maybe just run through that in two sentences or less. Okay, it's debt service coverage ratio. What that means is the PITI and the rent have to be, the rent has to be greater or equal to the PITIA or PITI. So when I say debt service coverage, just think of rent. So the first thing you want to look at, how much do you get in rent? If the client says, I, own, I rent it to a guy, I've never raised it. The first thing you're gonna to say to him, well, we do have products, it's just gonna be a little bit lower at loan to uh, value and do a no ratio. So we don't care what the rent is. Yeah, do you hear this guys? There are so many options outside the Fannie Freddie box, which frankly has gotten to the point where it's I'm so totally restricted, so expensive that it is not always the best rate, the best nope. way forward. So we have somebody who's who said that they have a cash out refinance um, that they are speaking to somebody who's currently working with B of A and they want to do some home improvements. And, um, but she's, you know, how do you compete with the bank right now? Like what's your, I know what you say, but why yeah. don't you tell everyone else what you say? 
Okay, so if you're competing with a bank, first of all, banking has changed. So the loans are no longer made at the decision at the branch level. They all go to a centralized mortgage center. And so by doing so, you want to make sure, like in this case, your client might be, I won't know if it's a refi or an equity line. I, if I'm surpassing an equity line, I try to do the blended rate. What's the rate you're getting on the second and what rate do you have on the first? That's right. So, so if your client says I have three and a quarter on the first and um, the second, you know, the bank's offering them and I'm just guessing 8.5. Okay. So then you're going to take those payments and come up with the blended payment. Now, if it's an owner occupied property and I'm at seven and three quarters or 7.75 and he's getting 250,000 cash out to pay off debts and to do all those things, then that blended rate probably is gonna be better with me than the bank. It all depends. Right. You have to see the weighted average of the payment. So again, get the rate out of your mind, go with payments. Yep. And don't be afraid to have that conversation. What are you trying to say to the customer? What are we trying to do? The objective is to get you to a lower payment. So you, I mean, right now cash is king. Sometimes the people want to have money to be able to go on vacation or to do this or help a family member. You need to find out the objective of the borrower. And in this case, it's a home improvement. Is he doing a home improvement because he has more fa family moving in? He expanded his family. You know, you need to find out the problem with the client. Again, it all goes back to you want to serve your client. You want to represent and serve the client's needs and not just guess. And it's not about the rate. You want to right. make sure that you're addressing what the client is looking for in a loan. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And also fun. the last time I talked to someone who had talked to B of A, they were including like their pet insurance and their DTI and all sorts of, like they go through their statements and pull different things and they include them. And all of a sudden your borrower doesn't qualify, not to mention the appraisals are often coming in lower than with a, one of one of us, you know? I, so, I had that exam happen last week I, or three weeks ago. Client turned away from a big bank. Debt to income is too high. I run it. My ratios are in the low 30s. I mean, right. how can you get that wrong? Well, I'll yeah. tell you, you know how utilities started rating on the credit report, but we don't use them or they don't yes. show up on ours? That was one of them. We pulled the that banks, off. The banks are taking the utility bills and they're yes. also taking what's called imputed income and in imputed debt. And they're saying in this zip code, there's more debt or there's more expense. And so they're actually adding a premium to it because it's saying it's more. And sooner or later, someone's going to address that. I mean, I don't look at it that way, but I have a $1.6 million loan, the same thing. He says he was waiting for the bank's decision. I said, well, I calculated at 48. If I'm at 48, the bank They're is going to, yeah. So lo and behold, um, I get the call Friday. He's like, oh yeah, I got to get signed up with your new company because guess what? The bank told him there's no way he's going to qualify. I said, he qualifies all day long under mine. I, but see, the loan officer waited, thir wasted 32 days waiting for the bank. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, Straight. exactly. Um, we have a comment here from Grant. He says, thank you so much for the guidance and, and encouragement, Tricia, Audrey, and Kevin. So, you know, people need to hear this messaging and we need to stay focused on that. And again, you know, it's so easy to get sidelined with all the crazy crap that's going on out there. But it is it is critical. And another comment from someone else: our buyers buyers need to look at the overall picture and focus. Oh, and not focus on rates. Thank you. I, was, I thought I was gonna have to put her in timeout. Um, but no, she got it right. So Dirk said, "Wasn't a flying toilet that what killed the wicked witch of the east?" <laughs> no, the best one was. Um, most people don't know this. I own California Manscape. Someone must have googled me and pulled up my LinkedIn because he just said, "Can she enable us about manscaping?" Again, that's about opportunity. I worked for Countrywide, and I was very close with Angelo Mazzullo. And let's just say he liked spray tanning and. So when they closed in 2008, I saw how much those guys were paying for this stuff. And I lived next to Irvine and I tell, that was like every man was hairier than an ape. And I was like, oh my goodness, I think I can. So I hurried up and I went to beauty school at night and I bought out a friend and opened up California Manscape. And um, 
So it's, I don't work there. I run it. Uh, I, I pay a manager to run it. And that's again, where opportunity comes in. And I, I joked, I said, every car salesman I ever looked at was hairier than could be. And so it, California Manscaped before the pandemic was doing about 750,000 a year. And then I signed a deal with Steve Wynn for the Wynn Resorts because I have a painless hair removal system and they use it now at the Wynn. And so two of my estheticians moved out to Las Vegas. And wow. Okay, so this is, this is, <laughs> okay. I just want to just, just back up for a minute and tell everyone that she also has a law degree. Okay. So yeah. to say that she is innovative and um, thinks on her feet and always looking for an opportunity. And the running joke with the two of us is that she is very, very, I mean, she's smart. She's always looking out for how am I going to make money? And she calls me Greenpeace because I'm always looking at, oh, how can I help somebody give it all away? And so <laughs> Trisha and I are a good team in the sense that, you know, like I've learned a lot from, uh, the way that she approaches life. So opportunity is the name of the game. And I, like I told Audrey, she's never done an I-10 loan. So I have a friend of ours who likes to embroider and make clothing. Oh my God. Oh my she's, God. She's making t-shirts for Audrey and I to go to the local swap meet that say Cape Paso <laughs> on the back. And then they say loans on the front. And so, uh, okay. And she's threatening, by the way, to get light up shirts and there's going to be sparkles involved. And I'm so like, that's so Talk about getting outside of your comfort zone. So Trisha and I sat down a couple of weeks ago and we made a list of things that, that I'm going to work on, right? And so I am actively working on things I have never done before. I've always, and I've said this before, I've always wait, been wait, very, wait. very, very, so like, oh, if I'm supposed to do the list? loan, I'll do the loan. It'll come to me, right? No, that is not our market, people. And I'm going to be a perfect example of that for you. So Trish and I are going to go on some adventures. We're going to make it, maybe do some videos. We'll see. And um, yeah, she's threatening to drag me to all sorts of crazy places. So let's talk about like, the bail bondsmen that we'd spoken about last year. And apparently that's on our little itinerary that we're going to visit. I don't know what shirt we're going to have to wear for that thing, but yeah, do tell. You're going to say money on the back. Okay. So my best friend from college is the one that's the embroidery queen in Utah. And she is getting these outfits. And I told Audrey, we're going to do six things that are totally out of your comfort zone. And I'll be you like I'll actually care and you're going to actually be me. And you're going to go out and try to do you think so i said the first time we're going to go call the bales mod the second time we're going to go to a swap meet we're going to go to the farmer's market we're going to wear a shirt about doing loans in spanish and serving the i-10 community or foreign national and she says i can't do that i'm like okay you have well, a shirt no, on to be clear what i said is i can't wear a shirt and i said that's I too bad that's too bad <laughs> and i said because even if you're afraid to have the conversation and that's why i'm telling people go you're go you're dropping your kids off for school if you don't, if you're not the type that put a magnetic sign on your car about loans, someone in the pickup will see that sign. You got to put yourself out there. And so I came up with some things with her. I said, you're going to contact associations that people might have delinquencies and, you know, that you can do mortgages for them. Contact some realtors about doing I-10 or foreign national financing. Um, I mean, I've even done it where I've even contacted this one's going to shock you marriage brokers that, you know, where you go get a wife out of Russia. <laughs> of course you did. Of course you did. I mean, so again, like, wait, wait, so how, how, why does someone getting a wife out of Russia need a home loan? Because they, they yes, because they need to have a home to start with that new wife. You know what I'm saying? And also going to Russia and doing that whole process. I only know this because I have a couple of brother-in-laws who was were scouting for spouses in other countries for a while there. And it's not cheap. You have to fly there. You have to meet the family. You have to take gifts. You have to do all sorts of things. So, oh my but goodness. It's like, no, but think about it. They have to spend money. They have to pay the broker and all the legal fees too. And you have to have 150000 liquid 
to pass getting all the government things. So I tell them, do a cash out on their home and then buy a new home too for him and his wife, you know? So the marriage brokers, the broker that I had do it was in Dallas, Texas. And he says, Trisha, I've got eight loans so far from that marriage broker. Wow. This is, he goes, this is amazing. And I'm like, wow. no, you're taking an opportunity that you already have. He has a Russian wife, you know? Wow. And my son played hockey. We were joking one time. He goes, oh, are you know, is the hockey coach your husband? I said, no, my husband's just never here. I'm with the coach all the time. And so he start laughing and he goes, my wife came from Russia. I said, really? And he, and she was telling me the process. And I said, how much was that exactly? Yeah. And so, I mean, there are people spending money on stuff after being locked in for a year and a half, they don't want to be locked in alone the next time. So listening to your customers, go outside your comfort zone. It's not just about rate or people being, people are spending money, clearly the yes. debt. So you got to figure out what they're spending money on and go to those things. Well, so what's interesting, retail sales numbers came out and they were higher than they were, they have been, and they were expected to not increase that much. And so people are spending money, but they're putting it on their credit cards. So at some point, people, that is our opportunity because even though they have and a three percent rate, eventually. they're going to need to pay that stuff off because nobody can sustain twenty nine point nine nine percent for very long. Correct? Correct. Yeah, yeah. It is. So there's, it is. There's a huge opportunity. I was talking to a buddy in my office uh, over the weekend, and uh, he was saying that's what he was marketing: is people with lots of credit cards, and he he does the Barry Habib thing. He shows them how. Hey, look, right. you're paying. You have, you know, seventy thousand dollars in credit cards, and you're paying three hundred percent, but you have six hundred thousand dollars at two percent. You'd be That's far right. better off taking an eight percent loan and paying off the whole thing and being done with it. But the average person, when you say something like, "Oh, you, you know, maybe you should do a fifteen-year fix, maybe and combine your first and second, maybe the the first thing is, but I have a three percent fix. Yeah. I'm not doing anything. I have a four percent, and you have to be the one to." do the math for them. You have to show them. You must. That's that's an old story. I've been dealing with that forever. I had a client, I explained to him like it's a boat. Like half of your boat is at two and a half percent and the other half is at 30%. That 30% is going to sink the two and a half percent down. It's that's just- right. Somebody, somebody made the comment that you're lucky if you get any guidance or assistance from a bank and that's a biggie. So for somebody who thinks, those, the same people who think they can push a button to get a mortgage could probably go to B of A and maybe make it through their process. But the, the rest of us- amazing what, if you ever talk to a bank rep, what they don't know about the mortgage world is just, you're like, how do you do your job? I don't get it. That's Thank right. You. So we, we have Katie who says, I've done my first bridge deal in this year after being in the business for 23 years. Only in our world would I have been comfortable to step out of her comfort zone. She's and now she's doing them. So again, that is the going to be our theme: is you got to step out of our comfort zone, out of your comfort oh, zone. I'm out of my comfort zone. I was telling Audrey about that before. I've got a mid midway construction project in Denver, Colorado. I have a uh, this one you'll love. I had a client who was making an offer on a second home in Maui two weeks ago. And then after the fires on Thursday, I called them and I said, hey, did the buyer that bid beat you out, did they pull out of contract today because of the fires? And he goes, I haven't heard anything. He goes, let me check. He goes, oh my God, Kevin, you are brilliant. They did pull out of contract because of the fires. Now I in, can go into first place and get the place I wanted that I got beat out on. So who knows? We'll yeah. See. So you always, it's a Warren Buffett thing, right? Your opportunity is when somebody else is too afraid to act. It's, yep. it's always the case. And again, Trisha is the king and queen of that whole idea. And so we need to embrace that too. And again, having her drive a, a well, I, another a win, let me over the head with it has been helpful for me because it's made me go, okay, I got it. You know, like uh -huh. we There's have always opportunity. Team. I actually thought of this this week. So uh, last Friday, client who was thinking about taking some cash out to buy a house in the UK, uh, changed their mind and decided that they would buy in uh, New York instead. Now, they could just get a mortgage in New York. They don't need me for that, right? But I can't do a loan in New York. I can't even refer a loan to New York. So I just said, well, we can stay with the same plan. We can take the cash out and then you can come in in New York and offer cash and beat out the competitors 
And the guy goes, that's a brilliant idea. Let's keep on with the plan. So I've still got to keep the loan. Oh my God. There are two examples in a row where Kevin is brilliant. I mean, are you good, Kevin? You're no, good I'm not good. I'm just saying you got to think outside your box. That's all Absolutely. I'm saying. Kevin Correct. is definitely that thinker. And then we, okay, so we're coming out of, um, we're talking about national numbers on the economy. And we had how many people were gig workers and stuff like that coming out of that, that income, the weight service income has changed and people are changing professions. You've got to partner with loans that understand that. Fannie and right. Freddie has pretty strict guidelines as far as income. So you need to have a couple other outlets for the creative income because there's just no way everybody's going to fit in that box. Even doctors right now, how many foreign doctors are coming to the U.S. because we have such a shortage of healthcare workers? Yes. Yeah. All right. Absolutely. So you mentioned so we have a couple of comments. So somebody, um, Katie had mentioned that banks, they don't pick up their, their calls after regular office hours and that no. they are, they're consultants. They're not licensed and trained the way that we are. Correct. And they, they're one trick ponies. They can do what the bank can do. And that's about it. And yep. so they have a box, they have to fit in it. If they don't fit in it, you have to start all over somewhere else. So there are a million reasons. Yes. So, uh, Trisha, I got to ask you this. So, uh, I know the answer, but I'm going to ask this because I know this. <laughs> because people are asking what a DSCR loan is. So, if they don't know what a DSCR loan, okay, they definitely know, don't know what a CDFI lender is. Um, we know it's a consumer direct financial institution, but what Just is Just Googled that, that 30 seconds different? ago. Yeah. What yes. is it that makes you different? So what they do is they serve the underserved. So basically, if you are identified by a certain zip code or um, an area as an underserved, they get a better rate. They go over and above to try to make things happen for you, where I don't think that happens anymore in any other type of lending. I mean, I, and so sadly, some of the competitors that had the CDFI, they weren't doing it the way they were using it just to get anybody into a house and stuff like that when really if you look at the cdfi products and i had a guy call me he says is a chinese guy in dallas considered uh, underserved i said i don't know put it in there it goes by zip code race and all that so it's very important to take a correct 1003 and then he calls me back he goes oh i put the loan in i get an extra quarter off i said great your client was underserved well, what if I identify? I mean, what are they? Are we doing like twenty three and, and me or one twenty? No, um, there's a couple different ways they identify them. One, um, it's on the application, also on their tax. If there's a tax transcript to it, they can do it. Also, you have a copy of their driver's license. Their driver's license will sometimes identify it. In California, it doesn't even say if you're male or female, so you can be, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can pick. You don't want to share your. Yeah, I oh. know. Okay. So, um, <laughs> okay, I haven't looked at my driver's license. But I know. But, I didn't look at the renewal either. But so, yes, yeah, so they're using another form of government ID. We're not going to be one of those lenders. Uh, again, we got to be responsible in what we do to continue doing what we're going to do. Well, and so be responsible, have that conversation. And you know what? The clients are hesitant sometimes to to think someone's going to under, you know, I have a great broker who does a bunch of crypto loans and he's black, he's African-American. And he's, he even says, he goes, my clients usually don't want to furnish it. And I said, but in this case, they're going to do better. And he goes, yeah, when I told them that he goes, prove it. And he showed him, he goes, it's a quarter different on rate. And he goes, when you're borrowing, you know, $1.8 million a quarter on rate, he goes, it is a big deal. And they, he says it actually made the conversation better with the client. They're like, so you found a bank that wants to do loans for black people. And he's like, no, he goes, but they're committed to service, service the underserved. And that's the part that needs to come across, not committing fraud on an application to save a quarter. Yeah. We want to make sure that we're serving the that we're getting the discount for the people that deserve it and what the program was designed for well and also just going back to and everyone should have done this back then too but when you're doing a loan where you're not showing income you need to be making sure your clients can make the payment in my mind that should always be paramount can you make the payment can your borrowers make the payment are they going to make the payment i mean it cannot be overstated that needs to be considered Again, regardless, because a, a lot of times we're pushing ratios on a full doc loan and 
We're not doing loans for people at a 51% DTI thinking that's all the income in the world they have. We know there's other income we can't count. So again, can they make the payment? So always make sure and talk them through it. That's another advantage of the CDFI. The CDFI has an owner-occupied no ratio. That doesn't mean you're committing loan fraud and the person can't qualify. We all know with multi-generational living and stuff like that, sometimes right. there's family members now living in a home, yes. multicultural, multi-generational. Yes. So you want to make sure, oh my gosh, you can get this person in a home and they're paying $5,500 a month in rent. They could own it because of the CDFI. That's right. It's, it is... It is a really important product as long as it's used correctly. And so, again, there are places that are using it correctly. Correct. Right. But in, it's an 80% owner-occupied, no ratio. You are still responsible for making sure that your client can afford the payment. You're right. still taking an application and they're signing it that this is my, I'm responsible. I know this is what my payment's going to be. I know that I'm signing up for a 30 year fixed mortgage at this. So that doesn't go out the door. Right. So what is the, okay. So what's the loan limit on that? $2 million. Okay. And what is the, what kind of reserves do you have to have? Depending on FICO, 12 to 18 months, and you just okay. verify the reserves with one month's bank statement. Okay. If you're doing a cash out refinance, can you use that cash out for your reserves? You can go 70% cash out in some buckets. Um, and I think 75, I'll have to look. I think it's 70 across the board and yes. And then it could count as your reserves? Correct. And then and what, like, give me a range on rates and what's your, the final. Oh my goodness. We're not going to go. Hey, 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 <laughs> listen, you just answered my questions, young lady. I, that's all I want. Okay. Two things. I'm going to say people, eight and seven eighths. Need, they want okay. a snapshot of what this looks like, right? Okay. So, so I'm going to say eight and seven eighths to nine and a half, depending okay. on that's where, beautiful. where we fall in that. And if you look at the risk pool, that's considerably cheap loan. Because if you added the LLPAs and doing it as a Fannie Mae, yes. you'd be almost at 10% with that kind of risk. Yeah. Uh, well, you can't do it at 10% with no income. No. Like it's crazy. Oh, I know. Yeah. But all I'm saying is we're, we're now getting into, we still want to be responsible lenders, but we also want to make sure we understand the products that are out there. So we are servicing the community. And again, what that CDFI loan um, is good for. You have doctors that are coming to the US, they're 1099, they worked under an employment contract and now they're this. You can do a CDFI loan for them and get them into a house. And that's, they came to America to serve their profession and to right. have the American dream. Right, so if, if you have someone like Kevin, who could not be whiter when you just look at him on face value, but his mother was born in Africa, does he count as underserved? Again, um, it, you don't have to be underserved to get the loan. A white person, anybody, anybody can get the loan. It's just oh. they get a better rate ah, if that's they're the underserved. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So it, it's, all it's doing is giving them a better rate. So again, they're going to do the CDFI loan for anybody that qualifies race, religion, sexual preference, anything like that doesn't matter. However, if you are identified as an underserved race, you will get a better rate in that community. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Do you have any comments on the Fannie Freddie shareholders getting um, awarded $612 million yesterday? Did you see that at all? Oh, yes. The, your LLPA is paid for that. Right? Yeah, well, I mean, okay, in, in their defense, I mean, they're... <laughs> There was a time and place when um, the U.S. government, while taking all the profits of the GSEs, took away all the uh, profits for the investors. So I don't know. I'm, I don't know enough about this to have a strong opinion, but I thought, eh, all right. But, you know, our, our LLPAs are also going to pay for FHFA to appeal this. So we got that to look forward to. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about appraisal just for a minute. I, it's been a while since we've done an appraisal update and- uh, Kevin and I were talking about that this morning. Uh, Freddie Mac had updated their appraisal process on August 2nd to expand their appraisal modernization initiatives. So um, we'll have more on that. I was talking to Tricia about it and she reminded me that non-QM lenders don't follow that just because um, they you know, they're lending on the asset. Yeah. Yes, we're lending on the assets. So yep. like I, the conversation you want to have with your customer, if you're going non-QM, do you have any deferred maintenance? Is your house look like it's in good shape? If I was to come over, would, is it completely livable? Is there any possible? 
right, right, yeah. right, right. We'll have those yeah. conversations. <laughs> Okay, so that I'm just going to say that that hour went super fast. Super Trisha, fast. how do they reach you if they want to talk to you? Um, my phone number is 949-309-9005. And then I my email is Trisha, T-R-I-C-I-A dot James, J-A-M-E-S at champion or champs, T-P-O dot com, C-H-M-P-S, T-P-O dot com. And if you forget about that, just email me and I'll hook you up with her and um, 8675309, right? Um, next week, we will have Glenn Stearns joining us. The week after that, we'll have Dan Habib with MBS Highway because we do want to keep track of what the heck they think is going on. But do not, I repeat, do not spend the next few days thinking, oh my God, what is the market going to do? The rates are too high. No, go get some loans. I'm doing it. If I can do it, you can do it. So Trisha, we love you. Thank you to you and Ranger. I can't believe that he stayed away as, through the rest of that thing. Only when and called on. What? Only, Only when you guys called them. Yeah. Ranger. <laughs> anyway, we will see you next time. And thanks everyone. Have a great week. It's going to be fine. There are loans to close. Go get them. Bye. Thanks, Trisha. Bye-bye. Thank you.